Hi, this is John Hope Bryant, and you're back at the Hope Global Forum annual meeting. Resetting America, or America on Reset, Healing a Nation, an Opportunity for All. Here soon we'll be joined by the chairwoman of the FDIC, uh, Helena McWilliams, as a friend of mine. Uh, she uh, is helping to run the largest and most prominent banking system uh, in the world uh, here in the United States. Uh, the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation guarantees all of your deposits. Before we get to her, um, uh, let me step back for a minute uh, and uh, frame what I believe is the most important reason she has made it and what I think you need to make it um, in today's environment. Uh, and I get this opportunity because, frankly, she got an important call from somebody in the world and had to step back for a minute. There was some emergency going on, so I get a chance to talk to you uh, until she joins us here in a second. But I wrote a book called Up From Nothing, uh, The Untold Story of How We All Succeed. Uh, it came out two weeks ago. It's already on the bestseller list. Um, I've got other books that I've written uh, to try to codify a thought leadership process, uh, a step ladder to get you into the game, whoever you are and wherever you come from. Uh, this book is about mindset because right now COVID-19 is trying to wreck your mindset. COVID-19 is not just trying to wreck your health. It's trying to wreck your confidence, your self-esteem, your belief in yourself. Uh, that plus the economic crisis and a 400 euro social justice reckoning of black America could cause anybody to question whether they have, they've got the right business plan. You've got three mindsets that you need to be focused on, two of which are okay, one of which you need to avoid. A surviving mindset. Uh, and the FDIC chair, I'm sure, will express it. She's had this before. I've had this before. Um, but far too many African Americans. Uh, and others uh, who came to this country almost majored in it because we had to. Um, and for way, for way too long, you've had an African-American population that has been specializing in ready, fire, aim, uh, trying to defend itself. And so this surviving mindset uh, is, is an emotional reaction to a set of challenges in front of you. It's a reaction, not a response. Um, you don't get ahead when you're trying to, to survive and you've got a surviving mentality. You're just treading water. Then you've got a thriving mindset. So the, 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 the surviving mindset, call that um, the leading up to the first reconstruction uh, after the, up until the Civil War, from 1619 to 1865. Then in 1866, you had this unleashing of potential in this country uh, of former slaves finding their voice, finally. And you had 100 years of progress, maybe in a year. Uh, but then they were pushed back again. Lincoln was assassinated. Others took over who did not have an enlightened view of the world. And they were pushed back again. And, uh, and so we've really been in defense mode, African Americans um, and poor whites and uh, Native American Indians. Um, but African Americans were the only ones enslaved on this, uh, on this soil. Um, and women uh, 400 years from that point forward. Uh, in the second reconstruction you've had in the middle of the 60s. So this has happened every 100 years or so. So now you have Dr. King, my mentor, Ambassador Young, who's co-chairing this meeting. Uh, Credit Scott King, Dr. Dorothy Height, Heroes and Sheroes, who stepped into the second reconstruction. That's a 10-year that's period uh, to define the civil rights movement. Mark Morales from the Urban League spoke earlier today about how we created, they created this thriving mindset, basically the middle class. And for mainstream America, that got codified in the Marshall Plan after World War II. Uh, 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 enough, uh, as much education as you can shove down your throat, <laughs> um, an apprenticeship for a good job for the future, uh, and a mortgage for a home, which is how they built wealth, how whites built wealth, because most of that went to white America after World War II. So you've got this, this, uh, this attempt at uh, reconciliation and, and recompense that happened in the, in the 20th century. It was about getting, getting a job, getting a way of life, uh, getting access to the club, getting access to uh, fraternities and sororities, and all the things we're playing catch up on uh, at that point as African Americans. 
And that became the birth, those two things became the birth of what we call the middle class, a thriving mindset. Now that's how you sustain a democracy. It's not how you build. The third mindset is a winning mindset. And that's what we've got to get back now because winners are builders, build wealth, build your own self, build income, build opportunity, uh, build prosperity, build the largest daycare network, uh, build, as we'll talk to the FDIC, the most uh, responsive and responsible um, uh, deposit system for banks, giving people the sense that they can trust uh, the environment that they're in and put their monies uh, it really blindly in a bank in, uh, 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 that they don't know. That's a lot of trust. That's a, that winning mindset allows you to have confidence, allows you to lean into the world. It, it encourages confidence and hopefully inspires self-esteem. But that, we don't have enough of that. We don't have enough winners. We don't have enough builders. Uh, and we've got too many people, black and white, uh, who today feel like they're in the surviving category. And you cannot have a surviving category with half of this country who are, who are high school educated, uh, who don't feel they have a, a stake in what's coming for them that's prosperous and, and aspirational, and expect for you to have success with widening income and in, in wealth inequality. It's just not a winning business plan. But America is a winning country, and we need to get our mojo back. And that's what I wrote about in the new Marshall Plan. Uh, that's been my life experience. Uh, and then you've got to decide what your role is. Uh, and then you've got to decide to give every American the, what I call the five pillars of success. Um, and those pillars uh, include uh, as much education as you can shove down your throat. <laughs> this, if you do these five things, I guarantee you, even with discrimination, bias, racism, uh, inequality, uh, sexism, whatever you're dealing with, you can level the playing field in your life. As much education as you can shove down your throat, uh, you never get enough of it. Um, family, well, the math, understanding financial literacy, what I call the math. Um, how does free enterprise, capitalism, economics, ownership, uh, how does it work? Entrepreneurship. Uh, uh, what does it mean to be a, a business owner? Being a business owner is different. Business, business is different from busyness. How, how, how does a, what is a balance sheet? Is wealth different from getting rich? Yes, it is. Is wealth getting from different, getting paid different? Yes, it is. Um, so who taught you that? So we have to do that at scale. So once again, the five pillars, as much education as you can shove down your throat. Understanding the math, financial literacy. Family structure and resiliency. That's number three. Number four self-esteem and confidence. I love this because I'm doing this like off the cuff. I'm just riffing and it, it just, it is, it's beautiful. This, it's, it's so natural and it's so organic, which, which shows you that you can do it too. Self-esteem is different from confidence. Confidence is your competence, your competence that makes you uh, confident. So if you're competent in something and you lean into that competence in the world, it'll give you Confidence, but that's different from having self-esteem. Self-esteem is how you love yourself. Do you love yourself? If I don't like me, I'm not gonna like you. If I don't feel good about me, I'm not gonna feel good about you. If I don't respect me, how, how could I possibly respect you? If I don't love me, I don't have a clue how to love you. And here's a big one. If I don't have a purpose in my life, I'm gonna make your life a living hell. Whatever goes around, comes around. And the most dangerous person in the world is a person with no hope. That leads to the fifth piece, role models. You model what you see. If you hang around nine broke people, you'll be the tenth. Whatever you hang around, you will be. These are the five pillars of, of success. And uh, before I go, I'm, I'm, getting, I'm getting into this now. I want to make sure I'm not, I'm not uh, holding up my friend, uh, the FDIC chair. So you guys tell me when she's ready. I'm, I'm really uh, having, a, uh, having a great time breaking this down. Uh, let me now talk about um, the three groups that, uh, that didn't make it, or, or three groups that didn't make it, and three groups that did, and and so that you understand this is not just about race. Race is really important. It's not just about race. 
So you've had three groups, I'm just going to pick it randomly. Um, if black was the only impediment, and it's really tough when people would discriminate against you based on race, uh, then we would not have had Caribbean blacks. Uh, you would not have had, my friend FDIC chair is joining us now, you would not have Caribbean blacks who've made it, Nigerian blacks that have made it, uh, Ethiopian blacks that have made it, uh, Indians from India, my Jewish friends. If it was just race and religion, if those were non-stoppers, and then, you've, of course, you've had African Americans, Native American Indians, and poor whites that didn't make it at scale. So there's something else going on, and it just so happens that, that my friend who's now joining us, the FDIC chair, the chairman of the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation, Helena McWilliams, actually is a composition of, of an immigrant group from, I believe, Eastern Europe who came here with nothing, who had uh, enough of those five pillars of success that she did make it. And, uh, and I want to talk about not just what she does and, and what the FDIC does, but I want to talk about her as a person, because I think that her story is important for those who believe they can succeed uh, in this crazy world we're living in today, but don't know how and maybe lacking confidence. Ladies and gentlemen, my friend, FDIC Chair, Helena McWilliams. Hello, John. It's wonderful to be here. I'm sorry I'm a little bit tardy, but I think you have a future with improv or something else. <laughs> well, luckily, it's, uh, I'm just being me. It's just authentic, so I don't have to read cue cards. Uh, uh, and I, it, got me, it gave me a chance to, 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 scale, to frame out for anybody thinking that oh, they're, they're seeing all these big names and this and that, how do I possibly become successful? And I'm trying to create this ladder where people can figure out where on that ladder they step into it. Um, now, if you have five of those things I mentioned, you're going to be immensely successful. If you have less than three of those things I mentioned, then success is possible, but it's going to be extremely tough. Those who have been left behind that you and I care about in this country had three or less of those things. Um, you can pick almost any of those three things, and, and, and if you remove them, it's hard to, it's hard to win. Uh, I'll repeat them because you may have not heard it. It was education. So you, you graduated top of your class. I think also trying to prove that a, as a, a woman you could succeed in spite of people saying you couldn't. Um, understanding the math. I think that worked out. You're the FDIC chair. Family resiliency. Well, family structure and resiliency. You take care of your mother to this day uh, so that you, that's obviously strong. Self-esteem and confidence. My God, you've got that in droves, <laughs> and role models. So you had all five things, even though you came from this um, challenged background, thus you went. Can you tell, them, tell the audience quickly, and I'm going to get a sense for how much time we've got with the revised schedule, but give us a sense, an audience sure. a sense of where you come from, who you are as a person, not the big title. And then we'll get into, sure, sure, sure. Get into the structure of the job. The title is actually irrelevant because a long time ago I decided to become, you know, Yelena McWilliams. And so that when I introduce myself, I don't need to say FDIC chair or a partner at a law firm or, you know, a, a big bank executive or anything else. I decided that I'm going to create a path for myself where I stand behind my name. And so briefly, I came from uh, former Yugoslavia in 1991 with $500. I was an exchange student for one year when two really bad things happened. My former country erupted in a civil war. And the airline I came on um, went bankrupt. It was Pan Am. So I had no, no ticket to go back home and I had no country to return to. And so, but even before that, when I first came to the United States, I came with an idea that you can come here, you can work hard, and you can, you know, movies sell you this story about, you know, you can succeed, you just work hard. And I was certainly willing to work hard. And now when I reflect back upon the last 20, uh, 29 years, uh, and what led me from $500 in my pocket that my parents had to borrow, frankly, um, and, then, uh, and then pay back manifold because the hyperinflation hit with the wars and economic sanctions. But uh, what happened is that um, I, I, education was everything. So I would say that in my experience, John, when you talk about your pillars, uh, probably two of the most important pillars for me have been education and that level of self-confidence. And so what I believed back then was that I can come to the United States and succeed. Whatever success may look like in the long run, I'm going to succeed. And failing was not an option. So I was hungry. 
I, you know, I, I mean, I worked a, a series of, of minimum wage jobs where they were paying four dollars and twenty five cents, really three fifty, three forty after mm-hmm. tax. Uh, I cleaned houses. I worked closing shift at Blockbuster. I sold knives door to door. I uh, sold cars. I, I, I did a number of things that, you know, at some point I should write a book about. You should. Um, and, and really what I never lost sight of is that I must get educated in the United States. And what, what helped me, frankly, was coming from a system uh, where education was highly valued. Not um, my parents did not have an opportunity to have education. So my mom was born in 1941, mm-hmm. and if you know history, 1941, she oh, yeah, literally was war. Born, uh, born two weeks before Germans carpet bombed the country. Yeah. So war educating too. girls was not a priority. She was just lucky she was alive. My father was born in 1925 in a very small village in Montenegro, and so he was pulled. Both of them were pulled out of school. My mom has um, an equivalent of a second or third grade education, mm. and my father has about a fifth uh, grade education. And these two people who were very humble, uh, very hardworking, exceptionally stoic, stressed that education was my path forward and my path up. And we had no connections. We had no um, no money really to buy influence. Um, and so there was only education. And so I had to be the best. Not being the best was not an option. Yeah. And, you know, when you talk about role models, my biggest role model has been, uh, in all honesty, um, Myself, I never competed against anybody else. I competed hmm. against myself, hmm. asking, did you do the best you could? And I have been my own worst critic and my own worst judge saying you could have done that better. And so as I looked at kind of a, who I want to be, I didn't want to be somebody else. I didn't want to be like somebody else. I wanted to be my best self. And my best self, that standard was pretty high. And so I, w- I would say that, you know, as you, as you look at your pillars, um, education was probably one of the, the the biggest things that propelled me in the United States because I came with nothing and again you know held a series of, of minimum wage jobs. Um, I drove 80 miles each way to go to school to Berkeley, UC Berkeley. I lived in Stockton, California, so 160 mile uh, round trip every um, every single day when I went, when I had classes and uh, I graduated with highest honors. Went on to law school. I realized in the United States, if you can, you should go to a graduate school uh, for a professional degree, preferable. And uh, from there on, I just picked career choices that uh, even when they included pay cuts, they led me to become my best self. And really, every career choice I had wasn't about money. And, and I always joke to people with people, you shouldn't ask me about money advice, uh, which is strange for the FDIC chairman to say, uh, as far as career is concerned. But um, I always pick the job. Um, I would ask myself, is this extraordinary? Does this bring you closer to being to having an extraordinary life and being your best self? And really, that's how, in short, I became the FDIC chairman. I want to talk in a minute about what you're doing specifically around financial inclusion and belonging and then black banks and the initiatives you've yeah. got there, some of which I think are very, very innovative and interesting and people may not know about. And you also have an advisory board there around community inclusion. But before I get to that, I want to back up. Ambassador Young, uh, who is co-chairing this meeting with us, early in his life, he questioned himself like you and I question ourselves. And you and I are very similar in the sense that I, we've, we've, we knew we had to be the best. Otherwise, we would not get a seat at the table. No one was going to expand the table and add a seat for us. We had to earn our place. And so I never wanted a but after my name when I left a room. Oh, we respect John Bryant, but. Oh, we admire John Bryant, but. Oh, we would invest with John Bryant, but. I want to remove the buts. I know that you believe that as well. But I, I, I didn't know, but. I, and I didn't know what my purpose was early on or my value. Ambassador Young has this story. And he was a young man questioning who he should be. He went for a long run. He mm-hmm. was in ministry. And he ran to the top of the hill. He was exhausted. And he had to catch his breath, Chair Williams. As he caught his breath, he looked around him and he saw that the trees had a purpose. The clouds had a purpose. The birds had a purpose. Even the dirt underneath his feet, the rocks had a purpose. If all that had a purpose, if God gave all of that a purpose, then surely he had a purpose too. The lights came on. He became his own role model to your point. And the rest, as they say, is history. He's changed the world, and he's still changing the world. But he had to become his own best advocate in that regard. He became a winner. A winner knew they were a winner before they ever won anything. What was that moment when the light came on for you where you gained your purpose and your passion? And are you living that now? And then then let's go right into the inclusion piece. 
Yes, and I, I would say I am living my best life. Every day I look up and I say thank you. Um, and it's remarkable how harder you work, luckier you get. Mm. Uh, I would say that moment for me came when I was here, the wars were ravaging back uh, my former homeland and my parents um, barely could survive. And I was making um, uh, so, so little money that I had $20, $25 left a month, every, every month for food. And uh, this was 92, 93. And I'll tell you this, at one point, I remember being both hungry. No, 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 stop, 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 stop. stop. Did you say 1992? Yes. And you had how much? $25 a month for food. I want everybody to listen to this. Listen now. The chairwoman of the FDIC, the largest and most prestigious banking system in the world. How many, how many deposits? And how much in the uh, Well, it depends. Right now, it's pretty high, about $13 trillion, yes. $13 trillion, who is, at the height of her career, uh, didn't have 20 bucks in 1992. And she's done this because she believed. Go ahead, continue. So I, I remember being um, exhausted, being just physically broken from trying to make it to three jobs and go to school and doing all of this driving, et cetera, and trying to maintain, uh, you know, the best grades, uh, 4.0, et cetera. Um, and I just remember laying in bed one morning, just my body aching from physical exhaustion and knowing that I have like three things in the fridge. And I said, by God's will, you're not going to fail. You are going to make it. And it was hard to see the, the purpose and it was hard to see the, the, the light at the end of the horizon. But I knew that I couldn't fail for my family. I couldn't fail for myself. I just couldn't fail. I, 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 failure was just absolutely not an option. And it was that moment, uh, frankly, that if that didn't break me, nothing will. When you're that, you know, you, you mentioned about nobody creating a seat at the table for you. I remember not having, you know, uh, people going to for Thanksgiving to their family or friends' homes, and I had nowhere to go. And um, just wow. being kind of a that alone, I say when you hit the rock bottom, um, there's only one way. It's up. And, uh, and I promise myself it's going to be as high as I can soar. You and Sheila Bear, um, uh, and I believe we're talking about now a Republican and a Democratic administration, if I got it right, uh, are two of my favorite FDIC chairs. And I think you'll go down as one of the best in the history of the FDIC, um, and certainly a decent, one of the most decent people to ever hold that seat. What are you doing right now to, to infuse that decency and your story into reaching back into those left behind, specifically given your mission? I mean, you, you, you can cut the Black Banks oh, Initiative. Let, let's, let's get into it. Yeah. Yeah. So one of the things um, I have, frankly, imparted my personal experience onto the agency. And I, when I took the job, I realized you can kind of fit what the job, you know, expects you to fit and, and be kind of a, the, the reserved regulator who doesn't, you know, put her emotions out there. Or you can make may basically make the job fit you. And I chose to um, make the job fit me. Mm. And so I have been a little bit more open than um, I would say prior regulators have been about the personal story, the life story. And the reason that I'm telling this story is not because, you know, um, I'm, 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 I'm boasting about my successes. Uh, no. I believe that if I could have come here with $500 and 20 something years later, I could have become the, the FDIC chairman, anybody in America should be able to have that opportunity. So when not everybody in America has that opportunity, we have an imbalance in the system. And so we have focused on how to create uh, an inclusive banking system uh, and bringing more people into the banking fold. Because for me personally, being able to get my first credit card was a big story and a big success. And, and I recently gave a speech at the University of Chicago Law School where I said, once I got that credit card, even though it was a secured credit card, um, you know, if my accent made me stand out in the checkout, food checkout, grocery checkout line, my purchase did not. Uh, mm. I looked like everybody else and kind of allowed me to fit in, fit in a little bit be, uh, more. And then over time, as I got different financial products, I became fully invested in the system, not That's just right. in me, but me a part of the system. And I want America to succeed yeah. because it's good. I mean, it, we should all want America to succeed. And so I, I when I talked to Ambassador Yanko, I'm, I'm a huge fan of, yeah. I basically said, you know, I became a shareholder in the United States of America and I want others to become shareholders in the United States of America. I want everybody to own a piece of, of America and believe that you can do so much and in this American dream. And so we're working with banks to make sure that this um, inclusive system can exist. 
Uh, we're trying to create opportunities for people who are unbanked and underbanked to become a part of the banking system. We're focusing heavily on financial education. And frankly, we're trying to do a number of things with minority depository institutions who are serving low and moderate income communities, whether communities of color or immigrant communities um, that, are, that, are, that are still trying to kind of be a part of the system, whether by recently arriving to the United States in the case of immigrants and in the case of uh, a lot of the minority communities, uh, just making sure that the system works for them. So we have, um, we have, I would say we have done a number of initiatives. You can find them on our website for minority depository institutions. But I would say a couple of the of the biggest ones that we have been um, able to claim some success from have been um, we created one I call it speed dating because this is not your grandmother's FDIC so we put put big banks and small banks MDIs around the table and we said come on l let's see if there's a there's a match made in heaven here mm -hmm. or at least at the FDIC uh, and we decided to um, to see if there's a partnership opportunity where some of these uh, larger banks that are non MDIs can either provide um, uh, equity support. Um, other capital support or technological support uh, or expertise to the MDIs. Um, and then I would say that the, the one that's um, hopefully going to be even bigger is we created a, a fund. We're in the process of creating a fund uh, where we, we, will be, we will be able to leverage the, the amount of money in the fund uh, to help the, the MDIs and to, to make smart investments with the MDIs. And so far, we have had um, we have been able to, to secure, which I'm very grateful, a hundred million dollar commitment from Microsoft, and we're looking for others. So, any takers here will take your money, and we'll we'll work with that to uh, to put it in the fund and make sure that money goes to good causes. Because when you think about it, every dollar you put in an MDI bank, minority bank, is going to be leveraged many 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 fold and go into the low and moderate income communities and communities of color. So we need to make a lasting impact. So on the one hand, we're removing structural chain, uh, structural obstacles through our regulatory reforms on how, how banks are helping these communities. And on the other one, we need to focus on, you know, getting more capital into these communities. Um, and I would say the third prong of that would be that we need to um, understand that technological innovation yeah. is Thing. So as a regulator, you're universe. You don't careful about introducing the system and with the uh, kind of a be-minded traditional on the right because technology is a great equalizer and we can use technology to reach people who don't have traditional underwriting scores, who don't have additional credits, uh, uh, traditional credit scores. You know, we can make perhaps even better credit decisions for maybe 20% down payment to purchase a house is not necessary. So there are a number of things that we're looking at both on the regulatory side and technologically uh, to see if we can if we can get to a better place with banking people who have traditionally been for better or for worse, you know, excluded uh, by default or by design uh, from uh, from the banking system. It's really funny, uh, Ms. Madam Chair, as you were talking about technology, your your uh, your internet service froze for about ten seconds. It didn't freeze, but it, it staggered. So while you were talking about technology, you know, somebody was messing with you on technology, and you walked right past it because you're a winner. And you you punch is what winners do. You just punch right through it, and 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 wait for wait for the world to catch up on the other side. That's what Dr. King did. Is he he uh, he, uh, he basically said that the uh, the arc of justice is long, but it bends towards freedom or something like that. And but he was basically waiting for it to show up. He didn't change who he was. He kept marching and waited for the world to catch up. And thank you for for marching. I consider this a march on capital. Not the capital, I mean capital, as in C-A-P-I-T-A-L, money. And, um, uh, and this is a movement in the suites as much as it is a movement in the streets. And what you've articulated is going to transform lives. I think you're probably the FDIC, the only, and I want to give Don, I'm going to hear a crap if I don't mean Don Powell. Don Powell's another good FDIC chair I work with. I'll hear a mess from him later if I don't mention his name. Another good guy. Um, but... I, I think that this thing you're doing with Microsoft, I don't know of another FDIC chair that's ever done anything with a non-bank. Here you are taking $100 million from a technology company, basically, uh, and bringing it into the, the system to try to infuse, uh, what well, to give a software upgrade to black and minority depository institutions. That's innovative thinking. We want more of that. So I, I'll have to tell you, so it's MDIs and CDFIs, uh, Community Development Financial Institutions, and frankly, what we did was I told, can you hear me? Is that I can, yeah, yeah, gotcha. I hear we got you. We got you. Oh, okay, good, yeah. good. Um, and, and what I told um, 
I'm going to get in trouble with my lawyers now, but what I've been, I've been thinking about these issues, I basically said to our lawyers internally, I said, we need to think outside of the box. We need to create something that's, that hasn't been done before because what's been done before is, has obviously not worked enough to get us in a place where we need to be with these institutions. So we need, we need you know, a big change. We don't need a you know, minutia, minor change, massaging the edges of the, of the framework. And I said, so I want you to create like an FDIC shark tank. And, and they cringed. They were like, oh, that's a copyright infringement. And I said, I don't care. Go think outside of the box and create something extraordinary. And so they came back, uh, you know, looking at our statutory authorities to think about what can be done. And that's really how the idea was um, was created. Uh, you know, l let's create a type of a shark tank. Um, and I, I'm, I would like to thank the producers of Shark Tank for wonderful ideas. We're not going to call it shark tank. But really, the idea is to put the investors who have benevolent purpose behind the investment with communities uh, through through these MDIs and CDFIs that could use the money. And so that's how it, that's how the, the concept came about. I don't think you have to worry about Shark Tank suing the FDIC. I think you're I think you're in good shape. Uh, <laughs> I'll be with Kevin. I wouldn't mind if Shark Tank guys wanted to invest some money in the fund, so I'll, I'll make that call as well. Well, I'll be with Kevin O'Leary from Shark Tank next week. I'll mention it to him. Uh, listen, Thank you. We're out of time. Unfortunately, I could talk to you all day. Um, you, you are an inspiration. The thing that, if we drop the mic here and people have to remember something from this session, because people don't remember what you say to them, they remember how you made them feel. Uh, a couple of things I want people to re re reflect on. She had came in with $500. People didn't expect from her, much from her. They really uh, had low expectations. She was a woman, so we had sexism and all kind of things, basically saying, you know, go do something not serious, if you will. She overcame all of that, went around it, went through it, went over it, went, at, went around it, punched through it, and demanded a seat at the table to be expanded, in, well, the table expanded and a seat added, uh, uh, so that she could add, not, not out of some uh, sense of... Uh, uh, charity, but because she could, so she could add value. And she, 28 years ago, had 20 bucks in her pocket. And look at her now. Uh, and For food. And I'll tell you, uh, Brian, uh, John, I, I will just add this. Um, you know, I think it's important for the people here uh, to understand that um, you will encounter um, obstacles along the way that are, that are serious, that yep. are real. Um, I remember early on when I was selling cars, one of the car salesmen who's been there for 35 years pulled me to the side and saying, um, you know, if you don't lose that accent of yours, you're not going to succeed in America and, or make it in America. And I said, oh, well, I don't know how I lose my accent, but thanks. Um, and and uh, you, you just have to believe in yourself. And then along the way, you have to give yourself the tools to execute on that belief. And that's really where education and and some of the you know influence that you can you, that you can kind of uh, uh, get from others uh, and 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 leverage it uh, uh, comes in. So thank you for this and thank you for a wonderful opportunity to to engage with you again. I miss seeing you in person and uh, I, I I hear wonderful things coming out from Hope Global Forum. And next next time I hope we, we can do this in person. I, I agree, and we're over time. But I'll leave you with this last thought. Uh, it aligns with your story. Uh, Dr. King got a C, uh, C grade, I think it was a C plus in public speaking from Crozier Seminary. And they told him, if you don't never stop talking like that, Dr. King, you won't amount to anything. I think he did okay, and you did too. So everybody continue to be well, yourself. Thank you for that story. Right. Thank you. God That's bless. wonderful. Take God care. bless.